Hello, my name is Deborah Russell. I want to thank you for your interest in consecutive interpreting. Our goal is to present a videotape. We'll provide you with information about consecutive interpreting and some samples of consecutive interpreting. And our hope is that that will promote further discussion in the field. Let's begin by examining what consecutive interpreting is. When I use the term consecutive interpreting, what I mean is that we're using one language at a time. There's distinct pause, pauses between the languages. Some people in our field believe that when you're using processing time, six, seven seconds, that that's actually consecutive. That's not what I mean by consecutive. When I'm using the term consecutive interpreting, I mean that the speaker has stopped, the interpretation is presented, the interpretation is finished, the speaker or signer continues. Consecutive interpreting typically requires that the interpreter know something about mapping or note taking, and they may need to use those strategies in a given situation. As well, the interpreter will also need signals that tell people when they need to pause and for how long they need to pause for. Let's talk a little bit about the history of consecutive interpreting in our field. Despite plenty of evidence in the field of spoken language interpreting that consecutive is more accurate in just about every context possible, the field of sign language interpreting has predominantly used simultaneous interpretation. When we think about some of the reasons for that, I think that maybe the language pairs that we're using have contributed to that, in that the language pairs that we use, a spoken language and a signed language, don't uh, have any overlap so that you can be signing and I can be speaking at the same time, which isn't true for two spoken languages. So without that interference or without that overlap, I think that's contributed to our use of simultaneous interpretation. I think as well that we've used simultaneous for so long that we've perhaps not examined it critically enough. And finally, another reason that we continue to use simultaneous is that it's rewarded in our testing systems, in our screening systems. Consecutive interpreting has a number of myths around it, and I'd like to explore some of those right now. Some people believe that consecutive interpreting is a stepping stone, that we use it in order to learn how to simultaneously interpret, but it's not a viable option to be used ever in your career again. There are others who believe that if you actually use consecutive interpreting, it must mean that you're not a very skilled interpreter. Some deaf people tell me that when they think about consecutive interpreting, they think that that's what their children did when they were interpreting for them. And the other myth that we have is that simultaneous is better because it's faster, it doesn't create any delays for people, and that it's accurate in all settings. However, we have some new research in our field that I think is worthy of examination. In my PhD study, I looked at courtroom interpretation and looked at four trials that involved criminal charges. So the consequences of errors was grave in those contexts. I also worked with teams of interpreters who were certified and experienced in legal settings. The study looked at three distinct discourse events, cross-examination, direct evidence, and expert witness testimony. The research results were um, surprising to me, but perhaps not surprising to others in our field. The two trials that used simultaneous interpretation achieved both an 87% accuracy rate and an 83% accuracy rate. Those trials that were conducted using consecutive interpreting enjoyed a 98 and a 95% degree of accuracy. And interesting enough, Dr. Um, Burke Seligson, who works with Spanish-English interpreters, has done very similar research, and her results show that the simultaneous work of the Spanish-English interpreters was even um, more discouraging than the results shown in this study. When we look at the actual discourse events, so if I look at the expert witness testimony, in one of the trials, as much as 10% of that testimony was uh, error-ridden. In the consecutive, you might have had five errors out of 292 utterances. So when you look at your handout accompanying this videotape, you'll see the error patterns for each of those discourse events. The discourse um, event known as direct evidence, and so by that I mean that the deaf person was providing their testimony. Out of 189 utterances, 39 of those utterances contained errors that were not corrected when done simultaneously, as opposed to four and six errors in the trials that were done consecutively. So we can see that the errors um, increase when we're using simultaneous and decrease when we're using consecutive, and that's in the hands of experienced and certified interpreters. I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of errors that occurred in those trials. One of the huge uh, error patterns was that of omissions. And so when we're working simultaneously, our memory is maxed out and we start to lose information. And so there was uh, huge omissions of content. 
One of the other patterns that emerged as well was a shift of tense, and so that events that were relayed that occurred in the past were actually spoken as if they were present tense. Shift of register in that the spoken English in the courtroom was quite formal, consultative to formal, and when you looked at the uh, interpretation, it would be casual in uh, register. Deceptive work also appeared in the error patterns in that work sounded like plausible English, sounded like appropriate English, but it wasn't at all the content that was uh, pre presented in the source message. Dysfunctional grammar was the other piece that emerged in all of the errors in that people pre were presenting work in their simultaneous work that didn't look like American Sign Language, it didn't look like good contact, it was a mix of something, but ultimately meant that the deaf person was tasked with trying to figure out what the interpreted message was. Finally, some other error patterns that emerged in the work. The work was very form-based when it was simultaneous, and by that I mean that it looked like English, like work. However, the consumers in these trials required American Sign Language. They were monolingual deaf persons who preferred American Sign Language, and that's not what they received in the interpretation. The interpretation was processed only at the lexical level, so a word sign equivalency, which didn't reflect meaning-based work. As well, there were patterns of awkward English, which meant in the simultaneous work, interpreters were correcting themselves, but there was a whole process of false starts. They would start a message, correct it, restart it, recorrect it. And what that meant when we interviewed the lawyers and the judges after is that uh, people questioned the credibility of the deaf witness, unfortunately, when it was a matter of interpretation. Finally, there were two other important uh, error patterns that emerged. One of them relates to the narrative structure. So deaf people were telling complete narratives, retelling events that occurred to them. And the interpreters, when doing the work simultaneously, frequently missed the topic mark or they missed the topic shifts, and they linked ideas in ways that were not found in the source language. And lastly, they skewed the perspective. And so if the deaf witness was retelling an event that involved multiple people and multiple perspectives on that event, that there was some skewing of whose perspective was being relayed at any given time. When I speak about the narrative structure, we know that there are seven stages typically found in a narrative, whether it's in a signed language form or a spoken English form. And typically those seven stages include an abstract, orientation, complicating action, a peak, evaluation, resolution, and coda. And the consecutive work certainly allowed for the seven stages to be realized in the interpretation. The simultaneous, what we found is that the work often missed the complicating action so in the case of a deaf witness talking about an assault, that would be the complicating action. And uh, what it appeared to be in the simultaneous work is that the interpreters spent much more time on the orienting information. So they spent more time describing the house and all of the features where the assault took place, but they actually missed the transition and the important markers that spoke about the critical event. When we're thinking about legal contexts, the potential for complicating actions or new complicating actions to arise during cross-examination is great. And so that's where the interpreters really needed to rely on consecutive interpreting for some of that new information as well. When the work was successful, when interpreters did do successful work using consecutive, what we found was that it was processed at the sentential level. So as I said earlier, in the simultaneous work was word, sign, oriented. The process was much deeper when the interpreters used consecutive processing and allowed for a complete contextual framing of all of the questions. And so if you're familiar with Anna Wittemarathur's work, she speaks about syntactic framing, which is re-establishing the context of the original question. And uh, the work reflected that when it was done consecutively. As well, when it was consecutive, the answers were actually linked to the questions, that we could follow the discourse and it made sense. The affect was accurate, and we noticed that in the consecutive work, the ASL prosody looked much more natural. So what we got was a natural cohesive text through the use of pausing and phrasing markers that looked visual in orientation by the use of utterance boundaries and by the use of discourse markers that we would expect to see in a signed language. And in the consecutive work, there seemed to be more effective monitoring as a team. When the work was done simultaneously, there were errors that were not corrected despite using a team situation, which is sometimes what we tell courts, is that we have to use a, a team situation so that we can monitor each other's work, but the reality showed that we aren't actually doing that. So for the legal setting, 
The results indicate that the entering of direct evidence is best accomplished by using consecutive interpreting that when using cross-examination, that it is possible to do the work simultaneously because the information is not new. You're really um, going over ground that's been covered before, rather familiar to you. But if there's new information that arises during cross-examination, which is frequently the case, then the interpreter may then need to go back to using consecutive for those portions. And the expert testimony, given that it was detail-laden, and had a number of cultural variables introduced in the testimony, required a blend of both simultaneous and consecutive. So the point of all of the research, I think, leads us to understand that consecutive is more accurate in a number of contexts, and it allows us to use all of the stages of processed models of interpretation. And so whatever model that you particularly use, whether that's Betty Kalonymus's or Dennis Coakley's or some of the other models that are available to us, the consecutive processing allows us the time that we need in order to work our way through those stages and certainly reduces the impact of contact sign. We have some other research available to us as well too. When I was uh, completing the PhD, I was then curious about how it is we teach consecutive interpreting. And so I did a pilot study of 15 interpreter education programs. And I wanted to examine how it is that we're teaching consecutive. Is it a tool to support simultaneous? Or are we teaching it as a viable approach to be used throughout all stages of one's interpreting career? And all of the programs that I uh, was able to include in the study reported using curriculum that teaches consecutive interpreting. But what varies is how that's taught. So for some, it's very much taught as a stepping stone, introduced in the first semester, never spoken about again. And then we had other programs that use consecutive interpretation through all of the semesters of the program and that they support interpreters using it in a variety of contexts. Students in that study reported that they wanted to be able to use consecutive interpreting out on their internships and their practicums, however, they weren't supported by working interpreters. And the interpreting teachers reported using consecutive in their own freelance practices, but reported not demonstrating it into the classroom. So I think our field is a, has a mixed reaction to consecutive. We have interpreters who are resistant to it. We have deaf community members, some who are familiar with interpretation and familiar with research and are open to its use. There are others who are not familiar with the research and who believe that simultaneous is the only way to go. And uh, so it really very much depends on the interpreter and their knowledge about consecutive. Some people have asked me if I get some training in consecutive, where would I actually use it? Let me give you some ideas about that. My sense is that we can be using consecutive throughout our entire careers, when we're working with children, when we're working with adults, when we're working with elderly. Some of the settings that I've used consecutive include courtroom settings, legal interviews, psychological appointments, counseling appointments, medical interviews, educational contexts, whether that's one-to-one uh, -one interactions between teachers and students, whether that's small group presentations or projects. So I think that there are a number of settings that lend themselves to consecutive interpreting and that we need to be guided by the discourse frame. So typically, my one of the ways that I guide myself is that if it's a one-to-one -one interaction, and it's an informational context that typically that can lend itself to good use of consecutive interpreting. A number of interpreters have identified some decision-making frames that they use um, that allow them to make a decision whether they should use consecutive. One of the frames is that they look at the density of the information. So when the information is complex, multi-layered, rich in detail, culturally laden, that those are places in the text where they may revert to using consecutive interpreting. As well, the language of the consumer can guide us. So that, for example, when I'm working with elderly um, people or when I'm working with children or when I'm working with people who are new users of American Sign Language but have other forms of sign language perhaps or have non-standard use of sign languages, all of those things um, help me to determine whether I should be using consecutive I also want to use consecutive when I know that the consequences of my errors is grave. And so I particularly think about legal context, medical context, psychological context there. The other factor that interpreters have raised is that when the interpreter lacks a context for the situation, they'll often resort to consecutive. And it's interesting when they speak about context because if we're going to get to meaning-based work, it has to be in a contextual frame. And that's one of the ways that they make that decision for using consecutive. What I want to say as well, too, is that 
when I speak about using consecutive, I'm not speaking about it as an either or situation. There may be some situations where you start off using simultaneous, you move to using consecutive, and you might end off using simultaneous. An example of that might be a police interview where I can predict the typical questions of the opening of that interview. So name, address, date of birth, where do you work? All of those questions don't need a whole lot of restructuring. I've interpreted those several times before. But when we actually start speaking about an alleged incident or a traffic accident or, a, or a, an incident that requires a great deal of description, that's where I need to wait, use consecutive, so that I can capture all of that information. Well, I think in order for us to um, incorporate the consecutive interpreting research into our field, one of the first things that we have to do is be able to learn to analyze our work accurately, and from a linguistic point of view, and from a cultural point of view. I also think that we have to start to be more honest with our consumers, both deaf and non-deaf consumers, about the quality of our simultaneous work, about the rate of our errors, about the number of emissions that uh, are found in our work when we work simultaneously. For those of you who are interpreters and you're interested in learning about consecutive, obviously what we need to do is we need to start to identify when we can be using it and how we should be using it. Some of the training that all of us require, we obviously need to look at our note taking or our strategies. We need to know how to chunk messages in appropriate places so that we're stopping people, asking them to pause in appropriate places. We need to create signals that can be used with deaf people and non-deaf people. And we have to be able to work in a team context so that frequently I'm using consecutive, for example, when I work with a deaf interpreter, but that requires teamwork skills as well. And I think as well we need materials in the field that model the use of consecutive, and that's what you'll see on this videotape as well. I'll leave you with some recommendations this morning. One of my recommendations is that our interpreter education programs need to be built on a foundation of consecutive interpreting prior to learning simultaneous, and that we need to view it not as a stepping stone, but as a viable approach to be used throughout all aspects of our practice. I also think that as practitioners, we need to be able to support each other in using consecutive interpreting. And if our field is going to change dramatically, I think our accreditation and screening tools need to incorporate the use of consecutive interpreting in their one-to-one -one interviews. Interesting enough, in Canada, their new screening tools and the newest certification system will allow for consecutive processing during the one-to-one -one interviews. I'm going to leave it at that for, the, for this lecture and allow you now to watch some samples of consecutive interpretation. And after those samples, we'll have a chance to talk with the interpreters about their work. I want to thank the colleagues who participated in the research that led uh, to our understanding of consecutive interpreting and thank those interpreters who are going to work these samples for you today. are doing very well, both in school and in the dorms. I do have a question for you, though. Uh, does Brian like sports? Well, he used to, but then got into skateboarding and more into music rather than athletic competition. I think he enjoys his music and um, individual skateboarding, bike riding, more than team competition. I've noticed that around campus, he does play in groups of friends, play soccer, that kind of thing. And I was just wondering if he might be interested in joining a team or not. But that's fine. He's doing, he's doing very well. Now, do you have any specific concerns? Well, I did wonder if he was 
not being too loner and that he was, you know, not really being, too, well, that he wasn't alone, being an individual. He, um, in the past year, I know it, with him being a junior and all, and thinking about going on to college, but I don't know how serious, um, he has kind of spent more time alone on the weekends in his room, and so, you know, I just wanted to check in with you and see how he's doing, but it sounds like he is interacting with other individual students, which is good, and um, maybe we can talk more about getting him into a team sport. noticed that when we're doing work in class, he does tend to want to work on his own. I've tried to encourage him to work either as part of a team or with one other partner, and he's told me that no, he'd rather do the work on his own. Now, I'm wondering, uh, as far as college goes, mm -hmm. he's going. He's a junior this year, he'll be a senior next year. Maybe as a strategy, maybe get him taking maybe one college class in some field that he might show some interest in, just to see if he is interested mm -hmm. in the field and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. I know he is interested in the sciences. How is he doing academically, keeping up, enjoying this, his science class, his physical science class? And he's doing well in school, and he does enjoy science. does enjoy science. Uh, when we go on a field trip, he's very interested. Um, maybe as a class for next year, we have a biology class in the college that he might be interested in. He could try it out, and if it works out for him, that might be a major that he might want to consider. Okay. Okay. How are the rest of his classes going? Keeping up? You know, I know we've talked even last year about his uh, SATs. I mean, he will be taking them next year. You think he's all ready for that? As far as the SATs, his scores last year were kind of about average. We could try taking it again and seeing if he shows any improvement. As far as other academics, history is a bit of an issue. He's been not so motivated in class, and I've been trying to work through that, thinking maybe um, we got him doing some projects, some current event kind of things, interviewing staff about current events, something like that, trying to work that out that way. Okay. English and math, though? the two main things. Well, 
Oh, he's showing a lot of improvement in math. You're doing very well. English, okay. Still some struggle there with grammar. Um, as far as reading goes, doing well. The big motivator there, of course, is his interest in science. He's reading all different kinds of science books. So we are seeing some improvement there. Okay. Do you have any suggestions on what, on the weekends when he is home, he should be working on, or? Things he could work on. Do you have any, any ideas? Well, do you want? Is he? I know he tends to say he's done his homework when he when I pick him up on Fridays, but I am not always certain. Um, how does he seem to be doing in the dorm during the weekdays? Do you know that? Have you gotten report? Yeah, the dorm dealing with during homework? the week? Uh huh. Well, he does do his homework in the dorms, but generally he doesn't have to because he finishes his work in class. The way I run my class is I'll leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the day for students to do it as they please. And what Brian will choose to do is he'll choose to sit down right there in the class and do his homework. Mm -hmm. I've encouraged him, you know, why don't you go out, why don't you play with your friends? And he's, he's perfectly happy to sit there and finish his homework. Um, so by the time he gets to the dorm, he doesn't have, it. Mm -hmm. have any homework. So it sounds like socially, though, even though he's staying back in the room doing his homework, he's getting along fine in the dorm, though, from what you know. His dorm friends are also in class, but uh, even despite that, Brian likes to do his work on his own, mm -hmm. alone. Um, I have seen him in the dorms. I, keep, I coach basketball. And when I've seen him, he's with other kids. He likes to ride his skateboard. There are other kids who also ride skateboards, and, and they're together you know, chatting, mm -hmm. chatting away. Mm -hmm. kind of I know he has talked about being interested in oceanography, like the sciences. Um, maybe we could still push that. The University of Oregon does have an oceanography course or you know, something related to the oceans, marine biology, something like mm -hmm. that. But they do have courses there, and, and we can encourage them to take a look at some of those. Okay. I guess the next thing is we kind of start working with him on getting ready to take the SATs again. Sure, he can take this, the SATs again and see if we can get a better score out of it, which will make it easier for him to get into college. Okay. Um, another, we talked about him taking a college course. We might give him a couple of options, something he can choose mm -hmm. to see what he's interested in and take that over at the college. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say something I forgot. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, 
any other suggestions on what I can be doing to help further him along? Or? What you might do is, is sit down and talk to him. Um, what I've done is uh, he and I sat down and we talked about what does he want to do in five years or ten years? Does he want to study oceanography? Is he interested in animals? Exactly what is he interested in? Just kind of brainstorm like that. You might want to try the same thing. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you came today. Thanks very much. I think, well, I think we got a lot accomplished. And, and, I appreciate and we can meet again at some you. point. And I appreciate all you've done. Thank you. And I wanted to thank a sample of consecutive interpreting for this videotape. I think it's um, incredibly helpful for people to be able to see modeled samples of interpretation. So thank you for sharing your work today. Um, do you regularly use consecutive in your work? It's hard to say that I regularly use it. What I do is I, I do what's called for in the situation, which means that I'm kind of working on a continuum from simultaneous interpreting to consecutive interpreting. and, and some situations, even some certain utterances in, cert in a situation require more toward one end or more toward the other end. There are a couple of situations though where I do definitely use consecutive interpreting. Uh, for example, in the federal courts in the United States, all interpreting for the record is required to be consecutive. So of course, I do consecutive interpreting there. But just any court proceeding uh, where I'm interpreting for the record, I will pretty much as a rule work in uh, a consecutive mode. The other places I use consecutive interpreting are in one-on-one -on -one situations. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually consecutive interpreting that I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm working with my, my lag time. And usually in a small situation, the interpreter has more control over kind of the flow mm -hmm. of the information as it goes back and forth. And just my tendency is to be pretty far back and sometimes so far back that, in a sense, it becomes consecutive interpreting. And uh, you said that you might use a blend of both simultaneous and consecutive in any interaction. What uh, guides you in making those decisions? How do you decide that this is a place where I should be using consecutive? Um, content and pacing, I would say, and mistakes. Okay. One, one way I know I need to go consecutive is because I've been up doing simultaneous and it's not working. Mm -hmm. And that's a clue to me that I need to back that that lag time way off and essentially essentially maybe going as far as being consecutive interpreter. Other than that, uh, situations where the information is very dense. As a beginning interpreter, when I was getting a lot of information, my first my first reaction was to get up real close to the speaker and just be right one word behind them so I don't don't miss anything. Mm -hmm. And as the years have gone by I found that a more successful strategy when I'm beginning to feel overloaded is to is to back up and to take in the information, give myself more time to process it and put each its place uh, in the communication and that helps me to, to interpret that whole big you know glut mm -hmm. of information that I get. And then also pacing. There are some places platform interpreting might be one where the information is just coming at a pace that um, it can't control at all, and I just have to do simultaneous interpreting. Okay, good. Let's talk a little bit about the interaction that you did for us on this videotape. There were so many um, great examples of where you'd restructured the two languages completely when using consecutive. Can you talk a little bit about some of the elements that felt like they worked well? By elements, I'm not sure. Well, there were some utterances that, uh, when I was looking at the tape, looked like they 
did exactly what you just described, which um, means that it, it looked to me like you were working through all of the stages of a process model of interpretation. And so it didn't look like form-based work to me. It looked like American Sign Language. It sounded like conventional English. And so there were many places where it really felt to me like a cohesive piece of work. Um, how did that feel for you? In the moment there, I'm not, I'm not thinking about uh, I'm, the language or the rules of the language, either the source or the target language. Uh, um, consecutive interpreting kind of lets me uh, divide the process in half. And OK, now I'm just receiving the source language. And that's all I'm doing. And I'm not even thinking about the target language. And then um, I shouldn't say not even thinking. I've, oh, that'll be a good. I might think of elements of the target language and just some ideas about oh, how I might treat that little piece of information. And then they're done speaking. And now I'm into the target language. And I've let go of the source language. So I'm not aware of, uh, in, in the, the piece we videotaped, I'm not really aware of places where I thought, ooh, that would be good to put in the beginning. Oh, mm -hmm. I should drop that further la later in the text. I understood it. OK, I understand what you, your point and what you want to say. And now I'm going to either speak it or sign it. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes out. OK. How about uh, the role of note taking? I noticed that there were a couple of places where it uh, looked like you were taking in the source language. And I saw you, it looked, looked to me like you were taking notes. Were those notes? And how did those support you in using consecutive interpreting? I've been playing more and more in my, recently with taking notes, in, just in my general practice and uh, in consecutive interpreting, because simultaneous interpreting, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to manage that. And I, I don't have a good answer for you as, into, as to what they do. I'm kind of playing with what the notes help me with. Okay. There are times when there are specific pieces of information. I'm thinking of numbers, sometimes proper names, often numbers, dates, real specific uh, uh, details that I'll put down that'll be helpful. Other times, it's almost, and then, and then in rendering the interpretation, I will actually look at notes to make sure I got the dollar amount exactly right. Other times, I seem to want to jot something down that is practic practically illegible, but the fact of having written it down somehow helps me process it in some way. Okay. So I'm, I'm really playing with notes and how they fit into my uh, interpreting process. It's, it's a new thing for me. OK. And do uh, consumers ever ask about those notes? No one has ever asked about the notes. I'm very careful with them. Uh, they're in a notebook. I uh, take that notebook with me. Mm -hmm. I take it home, and I shred it um, so that I am careful with it. And also, to be honest with you, I don't think anyone else, I, a day later, I can't even understand them. But, but I am very careful with them, and, and no, one's, no one's questioned it. Great. I wondered if you could um, identify some of the strategies that you use. Um, earlier, you said that you use consecutive often in a question-answer discourse frame, is what I thought I heard you say. Mm -hmm. And so are there some specific strategies that you use when you're using consecutive to make sure that you've remembered the question and linked it to the answer? I try to kind of earmark parts um, when I'm, I'm listening to the, the source language, OK, there's the first part. There's the second part. And there's the third part. And that helps me remember that whatever my interpretation is going to be, it needs to deal with three parts. Also listening. One of the great things about consecutive interpreting is it, is it gives me the opportunity to listen, both listen to the source and also listen to myself so that I can remember, oh, I posed the question in this form. Um, so that a positive answer, an affirmative answer, means this. And then when I, uh, I come back with the answer, I'm ab I've remembered that, OK, I have to answer it in this form to match the question that I, I just posed in, in the interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the interaction that we saw in the videotape, I, I wasn't aware that you used any signals to stop people. So were you just guided by people's natural um, places that they paused? Or did you actually have signals that you were using between the, the two people who were communicating? I, I didn't use signals. Okay. 
couple of things. One, um, none of the utterances were really all that long that I really started to feel like, you know, I'm, I'm hitting max. Mm -hmm. I took signals from them. They were finished. And actually, I think our, our speakers were pretty sensitive to me as, a, I don't know, maybe it's something they picked up. There's something about me where I, I kind of <laughs> indicated that, oh, okay, I have a whole piece now, and they maybe picked up on it and stopped. I know there was one point near the end of, of the interaction where I apparently cut off, I think it was the deaf speaker, um, I had, where it, and that was a case of me having missed her signal. I had thought she had dropped her hands, was finished, mm -hmm. and I began to render the interpretation. She hadn't finished. She raised her hands again, but I had started, and, and there was a bit of a, 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 a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. I think that often happens for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you want to comment a little bit on, is there anything that you would do differently if you had to do that scenario again? Oh, it's so hard mm. to remember <laughs> what happened. What would I do differently? Um, nothing comes right to mind. No, nothing comes immediately to mind. All right, great. I want to thank you again for showing a sample of your work. I think that uh, those who are watching the videotape will really benefit from you and your sample of work. So thank you for that, Ed. My pleasure. Your nurse for Dr. Stanton. Good, good to meet you. Good to see you again. I see you got the paper we sent you in the mail. Did you have any? Okay. Yes, um, I have uh, filled this out, although I did have some questions about. I wasn't sure if I should mark some things on here or not. Okay. Do you want to go to that now? We could do. We could work on that if you'd like to. Sure. Okay. And um, okay. Uh, which particular area did you have some questions about? Some of these that refer to the throat or kind of the stomach. Okay. Well, um, how about I just go ahead and um, the, the throat's really important because that's, you know, your breathing. Are you having any shortness of breath at all or any uh, trouble swallowing? You know. Has your voice been... So far. Has your voice been real, real um, sore at all? Or when you um, a hoarseness in your voice? Okay. This, they're well, just, everything's been feeling pretty good. Because that, that's what they're looking for is just generally just the general health. It's not that you should have a problem with it. It's just looking for something that would be a little bit unusual. So any other uh, sores or anything like that? No, it was just that one area that I wanted to ask you about. Okay. And is there anything else that you wanted to talk to the doctor about? Yeah, actually, I do have a, a basketball injury with my knee, and I wanted the doctor to check that out today. Okay, I'll make a note of that. How long has that been going on? I'd say it happened around four weeks, about a month ago, but uh, over the course of this past week, um, it's kind of exacerbated, has been exacerbated. Okay. And um, so are you having increased pain or uh, trouble moving the joint? Can you explain a little bit more how it's gotten worse?
Yeah, actually, it, usually the onset is when, while I'm playing basketball, and then I'll go home and I will have um, some aching and some, some pain there while I'm walking around the house. Okay. Um, could you tell me, um, does it hurt more in the morning then when you get up the next morning, or just you notice it just after playing the basketball? Right, it is usually um, while I start to, whenever we start to have a game, then it'll start um, hurting me, and then I kind of forget about it as the game goes on, and then I'll get home and sleep that night, and when I wake up in the morning, it, it hurts pretty bad. Okay, and so any history of arthritis in your family, or have you had an injury in that spot before? Actually, uh, as far as my family history, I really don't know of any um, arth arthritic problems. Okay. And then, have you had any pain when you touch the joint, or any redness or swelling? Actually, there hasn't been any redness. There has been some swelling. And whenever I touch it, it just, it's kind of an odd feeling. It's strange. Okay, and what kind of home treatment have you tried so far? I'm actually, I have been putting ice, ice on my knee for about 10 minutes. Um, and I'm also... Motrin. Okay, and how much Motrin are you taking? Um, I'll take about 400 milligrams, unless it's really painful and it's really giving me a hard time, then I'll take 800 milligrams, and I take that about once to twice a day. Well, that, that's a pretty low dose. Um, Advil sometimes, or ibuprofen is another name for it, can be real hard on your stomach. No problem? I'm having any problems with that. Okay. Any burping or belching at all? Okay. And what about when you go to the restroom? Any black or tarry stools? No, I'm pretty regular. Okay. And so when you eat and drink, you don't have any pain in your stomach at all? And what about uh, any kind of uh, brace or equipment? Do you use any kind of equipment on your knee? Or? I'm sorry, uh, did you say brace? Brace, yes. I do use a neoprene um, brace to help keep it warm and to help kind of keep it contained while I'm playing. That's great. Those, that's a good choice. Now you said you're putting the ice on for 10 minutes, is that correct? Yeah, about 10 minutes. You could increase that to 20 minutes at a time, um, but every couple of hours for the ice packs.
So you don't think that 10 minutes has been sufficient? I think a little bit uh, increasing that amount would be helpful, yes. Two to the 20 minutes. Have you tried We'll have to ask the doctor which would he uh, would prefer for you to use the hot or the cold, or maybe rotating those. Those might be helpful for you. Now, do you any kind of stretching at all? not the best stretcher. Um, I have to continue to remind myself to stretch before I do any kind of physical activity. Okay. Um, the doctor might even have some brochures for you that would give you some exercises for stretching. That might be helpful. Well, let's, let me write a little note for the doctor too. Have you had any x-rays or CAT scans of your knee um, since the injury or is this uh, the injury you haven't done anything but the home treatment? Great, I'll make a note of that for the doctor here too. There was something on this chart that we thought maybe um, I wanted to go over with you that you hadn't marked. Maybe we can look at this together. Um, now, do you drink alcohol? Do you just mostly drink on the weekends or for social events? Sure, on the weekend when I'm hanging out with my buddies. Okay. Um, what, what do you average? Two or three drinks or more than that? Great. All right. And any tobacco use at all? Now that would oh, that would include chewing and smoking, um, different things like that. And what about in something in the caffeine, coffee, tea, or the colas? Are you a heavy consumer of those? I do drink coffee. Um, I'll have a pop every once in a while, but I really don't do tea. Okay. And you haven't noticed any stomach pains or anything along that line? that goes when you drink the coffee or, or the teas, or, the, or the, the, co the coffee or the colas. No, never. Okay. Can you describe your diet to me? What kind of things you eat in a day? What, what kind of foods? Those quick snacks, huh? <laughs> okay, what about your weight? What is your weight? I'm 170 pounds. Well, that's great. Sounds like you're in good shape. Now, was your weight about the same a year ago?
babies from five years ago. No, not drastically. I have noticed that it just varies from five to ten pounds. Okay, great. Well, looks like you did a great job filling out this form. Everything's complete. So with the notes I took about your knee and the treatments you've done, the doctor can come, come in here and give you some good advice and maybe order an x-ray for you. Does that sound good? Great. Well, it's been good seeing you again. Thank you very much. Hi, Nick. Hi. I want to begin by uh, thanking you for sharing a sample of your work um, for us. I think that each of us learn from watching each other's work, so thank you for being willing to do that. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the medical interaction. Can you identify some things that worked well for you um, while using consecutive interpreting? Um, I find that um, the position of the interpreter was pretty important, especially whenever you have the dialogue between a nurse or a doctor and the patient. Um, so that worked really well. Um, and also just kind of the physical setting um, seemed to facilitate a, a more of an effective communication. Okay, good. And uh, it seemed like you used consecutive interpreting for all of the utterances throughout the interview. Can you talk a little bit about how the consecutive processing may have impacted on your interpretation? Um, yes, actually I was, um, I found that I was able to kind of um, spatially set it up in my head better um, using the consecutive um, mode and um, kind of um, along the same lines of you know, simultaneous um, interpreting um, consecutive um, was able I, I, I was able to produce at more of a um, to the point and direct uh, mm -hmm. to the point more I thought more clear than possible simultaneous okay when you uh generally do your work. I'm assuming that most of the time it is simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you identify what would have been different if, if you had done it simultaneously? Sure. And, uh, and I do work more in an educational setting and in a classroom. It is kind of hard to have that much um, uh, using the consecutive mode. Um, a little bit different, something that would have been different, I think, um, I probably would have it may have looked a little bit of the same because the utterances were relatively short. There was um, some information that was um, in chunks. Um, I would say the majority of it was not. It was kind of a question answer, um, getting more information uh, from the patient. Um, simultaneous, I think, just would not have had that much lag time. And it would have been, I probably would have started three, four words um, into the. Um, uh, into the, with the person, the nurse who was talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you regularly use consecutive? Not regularly, no. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Um, is there anything that you would do differently, thinking back on the interview? Um, one thing that, that does come to mind, um, there were times whenever I noticed that I thought that the nurse um, was finished, and my hands came up, and then she, um, she made uh, another utterance, and so my, my hands went down, which could have possibly ca caused some confusion for uh, the consumer. And so I probably would have maybe um, given that a couple of more seconds, or maybe have even um, had a little uh, a hand sign or a gesture to make sure that she was had finished. All right. 